today we begin talking about the creative process. Um, within the creative process, if you look at your schedule, we also talk about message objectives, creative concepts, creative strategies, creative strategy statements, and today we'll talk about cre creative creativity in general. So we're going to start with some examples of things that's creative. Just in general, um, creative creativity is the same across domains, um, whether it's music, poetry, art, physics, crafts, dance, film, building design, and of course, advertising. So people usually get a little anxiety, um, the students in general, when it comes to being put on the spot to be creative, being creative for your assignments um, and things of that nature. And like I told you all at the beginning of the semester, we're going to be doing a lot of in-class exercises where we'll work on um, how to come up with ideals and how to be creative, how to come up with concepts and things of that nature. But first, I want to just talk about creativity in general. So let's start with me showing you some example of things that are creative in general. Um, and let's start here. This is just um, computer graphic. Um, is a light bulb and a fish inside the light bulb. It's all computer generated. Um, if we were in class, we would actually talk about each one of these and as a point of reference of what you think is creative. So what I would ask you is, do you think this is creative and why? Um, or what's creative about it? So as we go through these few examples, think about that for yourself. Do you think this is creative? Why do you think it's creative? Why not? Here's another one. Um, this is just a hand painting. Um, and these are things that I've collected over the years that represent creativity across different domains. Um, so hopefully you feel like they're creative as well. Um, this is actually a painting. And you have the man on the boat, you have the moon in the background, look like it's coming out of the water. Um, this is just an abstract painting that goes across two panels. This is a statue that looks creative um, because of it's different. It actually looks like it's moving. Um, it doesn't look like it's um, stagnant. And the person is swinging around this chow. Um, something that'll make you stop and look at it, even though it's just a statue. Here's fruit art. They've taken common fruit, um, like oranges and olives and um, watermelon and pineapples and made it look like a, a duck type of exhibit or birds. Um, so very creative. Now this is an amazing wave that was made out of logo blocks only. Um, this was an exhibit in a Korean museum and 2012. This is a total of 686,000 Lego blocks. Um, it took 1,300 hours to complete. It's 12 feet high and the width is 6 feet wide and it weighs 1.2 tons. The second picture on the right kind of gives you a, um, a close-up. You can kind of see the Lego blocks a little more, um, but amazing what you can do with something as simple as Lego blocks. Here is something else that is a computer graphic. Um, you have the dolphin or whale, and then you have the um, mountain lion that, and they both look like they're coming out of the sea. And it's computer put together um, through computer manipulation. 
to make it look like they're jumping together out of the water and jumping back into the water. Um, we'll look at this artist stuff um, some more later on in the semester, but this is a 3D painting, an illusion. Um, there's not really a hole there. This is a, a flat painting, like you can walk across that. And, um, but it looks like it's 3D. People are walking around it, um, but it's actually a flat painting. So that's pretty different, pretty unique, and pretty creative. Here's another 3D painting illusion by the same artist. Um, this is also a flat painting. If you were to walk down the street, you can actually walk over what appears to be a hole there. Um, it's not really a hole there. Nobody's trying to climb out and get in, get out of there. Um, so very impressive. And another one from the same artist. <clears throat> and then you have this guy here in the middle who's on his knees to make it look like he's um, stuck in this mound of stuff. But it's just flat painting. And another one of this Sony computer. This was um, painted by the same artist, but for advertisement for Sony and their new computers that came out at that time. Looked like a 3D painting. Um, well, it looks like an actual computer is there, but it's a, a, just a 3D painting instead of um, a flat surface. But it's on a flat surface. So think about all of these things that we just looked at. Um, like I said, I collected these things over years of examples of creativity. What do all these examples of creativity have in common? There are two main things here. So think about it for a second. The first one is a degree of uniqueness. They're unique. They're outside of the box. They're unexpected. They're different. They're just, they just have a degree of uniqueness. So you keep that in mind when you're doing your own designs. You want it to be unique. You don't want it to look like the next person's ad um, with just another name on it, another brand on it. The second thing is they have a degree of familiarity, meaning even though they're unique, we still understand what they represent, what they are. Um, so it can't be so outside of the box that people are like, huh, what, what is this? Okay. So those are your two main things that creativity has in common, no matter what medium that you're using. So let's define creativity. Creativity is taking existing things and combining them in new ways for new purposes. So you have existing things that already exist and you combine them in new ways for new purposes. So let's just look at one of the examples, the fruit art. The fruit is, a, is something that's existing. What they made the fruit look like is something that existing. Um, but they combined them, the fruit in this design, for a new purpose so, so that it looks like art. So it looks like ducks, right? And you can go through all the ones that we looked at and you can say the same thing about them. And that's why they fit into the realm of creativity. Another thing to keep in mind is creativity is the ability to consider and hold together seemingly inconsistent elements and forces making new connections. So this is just another way of saying what we've already said about taking existing things and combining them in new ways. Okay, so creativity is the ability to consider and hold together seemingly inconsistent elements and forces making new connections. So let's think about creativity from an advertising perspective. 
This is an ad for condoms. I'll let you look at it for a minute. Think about it. Do you think this is creative? And why? Well, it has it does have a degree of uniqueness. It's unique, but it's also familiar. We understand firemen going into a fire. We understand this one person in the middle is not prepared to go into this fire. And that's showing, hey, don't use um if you don't use condoms, you're being stupid. So having sex without a condom is like going and to put out a, a fire without your gear on, right? Let's look at some more. This ad is for don't drink and drive. It's unique. Um, this is actually um, on a pavement and it's a print ad. But it's familiar. We understand those lines mean that's where you're supposed to park. However, you have a tree there. If you drink and drive, you may run into a tree and that's where you will be parked, basically. Pretty creative. Now, this one sometimes is a little disturbing for people. Either they like it or they don't. Um, this is an ad for Strawberry Fanta and they did pretty much all of their flavors. Um, but the strawberry Fanta tastes like real strawberries in your mouth. And that's the whole point of having the tongue look like a strawberry to show how strong the strawberry flavor is. And like I said, they did it with other, um, their other flavors as well. What about this one? And this fits into, which we'll talk about later in the semester, guerrilla marketing and out of home marketing. Um, this is for Mr. Clean. It's unique and it's familiar. So we understand that those lines are painted white, but after a while of people walking on them and cars rolling over them, um, they get a little dingy looking. But if you use Mr. Clean, which is exaggerated, of course, um, that doesn't happen. So Mr. Clean is so effective, you can clean the white lines that are painted on the street and they'll stay clean. So that's pretty creative um, because it's unique and it's familiar. This next one is a TV commercial that you might have seen. Um, this was done by the Martin Agency in Virginia. And it's for Oreos, and it's called Celebrate Childhood, 100-Year Anniversary. Um, so let's take a look at it. Wonder if I gave an Oreo to the big bad wolf. How would the story go? Would he still go huff and pop? Or would he bring those pigs cool stuff? to decorate the deck he helped them build would they not get killed wonder if i gave an oreo to a vampire in a creepy show would he So as you can see, um, this is very unique, but it's familiar. Um, it's children's stories that we're familiar with. Um, little Red Riding Hood, Big Bad Wolf, The Three Little Pigs, things like that. But it's unique how they told 
retell the story um, using Oreos. So it fits into that whole creative realm as well. The next clip I want you to watch, um, it's about a five minute clip from Professor Sutton of Stanford University, giving you examples of the definition of creative creativity um, that we've already discussed, just so you can get a more grasp of this whole creative. People say creative all the time, but they really don't understand what being creative is or what is creative. Um, so I want to give you a, a few different as aspects um, about being creative. Okay, so let me start out with this question of what is creativity, which seems like sort of like an obvious question. Maybe it's doing something new. But um, I have a doctoral student who's now a professor at UC Davis named Andy Hargadon. And Andy and I spent quite a few years fretting over this. In fact, he talks a lot about this in his new book, which is called How Breakthroughs Happen. And um, the thing that we came upon in every creative act we could look at, essentially, it was doing new things with old things. It's not like the ideas come out of thin air. It's finding some old ideas, some old concepts, doing new things with them, blending them together in new ways. And this is an incredibly simple insight, but it actually has a lot of guidance about what you should do and how you should organize a creative group or organization. And we'll get into that in more detail as we go along. And let me give you two extreme examples, sort of in terms of levels of complexity, to illustrate this point. The first one is the way that Play-Doh was invented. So I looked into the invention of Play-Doh for uh, my book, Weird Ideas That Work. And, and what we discovered was Play-Doh was invented, um, or at least made, by a guy named Joe McVicker, who had a plant. It was a plant in uh, central Ohio that made white goo for removing soot from wallpaper. Uh, maybe some of the professors in this room are old enough to remember there was a point where uh, much of the heat in the United States switched from being coal-based heating, which was sort of dirty and smudging, to, um, to gas and electric. So the problem was that the smudge was going down and this market was shrinking. And the problem Joe McVicker had is, what did he do with this goo that was being made from his plant, this white goo? And he did what people tend to do, which is he called in industry experts who had a great deal of, deal of knowledge about sort of soot and wallpaper and all that sort of stuff. And they told them essentially to do a total quality management movement, get the thing more efficient, squeeze every penny out of it. Six Sigma would be the modern term. Um, but then things kept getting worse and worse until he talked to his um, sister-in-law, Kay Zufall. And Kay Zufall was a nursery school teacher. And she gave it to her kids to play with. And she said, this stuff is much easier for little kids to squeeze with their hands than the hard modeling clay. And she suggested um, coloring it and calling it Play-Doh, and the rest is history. He sold the plant to Kenner for millions of dollars some years later. So that's one example. And to give you a whole other extreme of complexity, there's a great case some of you may know about um, of the case of a guy named Andrew Wiles. Andrew Wiles was a professor who solved for Ma's last theorem. And there's a movie about it and a book about it you can um, look up. But the interesting thing about Andrew Wiles was that he stayed at home working in his study for eight years, eight years, and he didn't tell his colleagues what he was working on. In fact, they thought he went crazy and just had stopped being productive. And I could just see if I wrote on my Stanford annual report, I've been in my room working at home, but I won't tell you what I'm working on. Essentially, that's what he did for eight years. Um, and, he, and even us academics would get in trouble. This is the advantage of the tenure system. He had tenure. Um, but what he was doing during those eight years was he was using the various work of the mathematicians who came before him as puzzle pieces to solve the problem. So even in the case where you have somebody sitting in a room by himself for eight years working on stuff, it's not like the ideas come out of nowhere. It's picking all that came before him. And to use the Isaac Newton phrase, the reason he could travel so far was because he was standing on the shoulders of the mathematicians who came before him. And to give you a couple of other examples I've got pictures for, and this is really sort of simple creativity that made huge bucks. I did some uh, consulting work with People Magazine about a year ago. And the most profitable thing they've done in recent years in People Magazine is a thing called the annual. What the annual is, you know when you see People Magazine in the store, they'll be like the best dressed, the best looking, the most intriguing, those sort of issues. What they do is they smash it all together and sell it to you for, in a book for $10. No original content at all. 
That's an annual, and they made a fortune on those things. So that's, that's one example. And another example, which has more technology in it, since this is a technology ventures program operation, is if you look at the iPod, um, they went from having no product to having the product out in eight months. And for those of you who know this story, um, most of it was not original, except for the interface and the industrial design. It was nearly all off-the-shelf stuff, and that's how they could move so quickly. And in fact, I think this is an especially good lesson if you want um, to have fast creativity, um, what, you don't sort of just lock yourself in a room and only think of your own ideas. Even in Andrew Wiles' cases, he's um, taking places from other, um, ideas from other places. You treat creativity as an import-export business. That's how it happens fast. And that's also the reason why, and I think that that's one of the things that happens with ETL, perhaps accidentally or on purpose, one of the reasons I think Silicon Valley works so well is that there's, there's such sort of porous exchange of ideas, and this will be on videotape, but that's okay. Um, to quote our president, John Hennessy, one of the first things I ever heard him say when he was our dean was, um, one of the main services that Stanford provides um, Silicon Valley is it provides a place where people can come and break their NDAs or non-disclosure agreements and move ideas around Silicon Valley. <laughs> so, uh, so that's sort of the, the first big idea is, is that uh, to understand what creativity is, and in many ways, what you need to do to make it happen is you have to have this, this notion of doing new things with old things, okay? So that's the first idea. What is creativity? Certainly a painter is creative in how she perceives a scene or emotion and puts it on canvas. But just because you can't paint like Van Gogh, play the cello like Yo-Yo Ma, or write a story like Hemingway doesn't mean you're not creative. A doctor at Mayo Clinic is looking into creativity and what he found may surprise you. Creativity is the intentional effort to change what is into what should be. We perceive what is. We envision something better. And we make a deliberate effort to make that change. Neurologist Dr. Richard Caselli is exploring creativity. He's concluded that there are five steps to creativity. Motivation, perception, execution, temperament, and social context. Dr. Caselli says the steps to creativity don't just apply to art and performance, but to how you approach problems. Yes, the virtuoso is creative when he makes music, but creativity pops up in unexpected places. Like in a traffic jam on your way to work. So now you've perceived what is. Major traffic jam, I'm going to be late. You now envision what should be, not being in a major traffic jam you now formulate a strategic plan. You take a detour, avoid the gridlock, and make it to work on time. You please your audience, your boss, and co-workers, thus satisfying the social context. Creative thinking. So if you're in the midst of a creative process, be it writing a novel or trying to solve a problem at the office, and it's not working, look back at the five steps and find out where you need to spend some energy. If you need help executing your idea, put together a plan. Do you have the temperament to follow through and complete your creation? Any step in the process can be a place to improve. The good news is that you don't have to be a genius to be creative. Of course, not everyone has the same talents, and let's face it, most of us will never become famous musicians or painters. But by looking at the steps to creativity, we can possibly improve the process and enjoy a more creative life. In addition to his interest in neurology, Dr. Caselli continues to explore creativity. For Medical Edge, I'm Vivian Williams. Okay, so hopefully you have the whole ideal of what being creative and what is creative, um, a better understanding of it. It's not just um, knowing how to use Photoshop or knowing how to use InDesign or Illustrator. It comes way before that. Um, those are just tools. So creativity um, is the whole concept behind make, taking something old and combining it with something new and coming up with something unique but familiar. So just keep those concepts in mind when you're working on your own stuff. Okay, let's talk about James Webb Young. <clears throat> 
you all were supposed to read um, the chapter on, um, well, the book on Canvas, a tech, a technique for producing ideals um, for today. And so let's just talk a, a little bit about this. Um, this is another person in history that you should know, being an advertising major or going into advertising. Um, he worked in advertising at J. Walter Thomas in the 20s and 30s. Um, he was um, a professor of business history and advertising at the University of Chicago. He was awarded Advertising Man of the Year. Um, he was inducted into AAF, um, American Advertising Federation, which you are, some of you are part of, um, Hall of Fame, and they have a museum celebrating extraordinary women and men who have made significant contributions um, to advertising in society. And he broke advertising taboos. Um, so I want to show you, um, you know, how he made a big impact in the world of advertising. Back in um, the 20s and 30s, it was a lot of taboos of things that you couldn't do. And the next ad I'm going to show you is one of them, one an ad that he created that was a big deal. Um, it's called The Curve of a Woman's Arm. In this ad, he talked about um, women and body odor. Um, the ad is famous not so much for the design, of course, but for the topic. The topic was taboo. You don't talk about women um, like that or talk about their private parts and things of that nature. Um, this was very taboo topic at the time. And so this is one of the big impacts that he made on advertising. Um, as I mentioned others, um, when we first talked about him, but um, this is what he's known for, the curve of a woman's arm at um, for um, women body odor, correction of women's body odor. But another thing that he's famous for is the process for generating ideals. Um, this book keeps being republished. Um, originally it was published in the 70s and this process has not changed um, and it's all, it's being republished over and over again. And so let's talk about that. The first process, which you should have read about, is preparation. So we think about generating ideals. And once we go to these steps, you might have an aha moment and say, um, I do this all the time, but you really don't understand what's going on. And so this is a way of putting it out on paper so you kind of understand what exactly um, is going on and what you're doing. The first um, stage is preparation. Um, and that's when you gather specific information and, and general information. Um, it's like brainstorming, which we, of course I keep saying we'll discuss later and we'll do um, later. Um, but you just start brainstorming ideas. So you have this challenge that you have to meet. You have to come up with this creative ad for a brand and you have your strategy statement or what you need to focus on. And so you just start brainstorming, gathering information. Um, it can be general. It can be specific. Um, it can be research that you're doing, um, things of that nature. So that's preparation. The next step is digestion. So when you're doing brainstorming, you don't judge your ideals or anyone else's. You just throw things out there. They can be crazy ideals. It's okay because you can dumb down a crazy ideal, but you can't take a boring ideal and make it better. Well, it's harder to do that. So at this stage, you start to get rid of obvious things, the things being ideals. Um, so you go through that list or you go through that research and you say, we don't need this. Uh, this is unreasonable. We can't work with this. Um, this is not in the budget or whatever the reasons are. And you take those things out. And then at that point is the third stage, <clears throat> incubation. So you take a break and do anything except work on the problem. 
So that you can use these steps in anything you do. So um, you're studying for an exam. At one at some point, it gets overwhelming. You take a break, you walk away from it, and you come back with a refreshed mind. This is the same way when you're generating ideals. You put your mind into it in the preparation stage where you come up with all these different ideas. Um, you're brainstorming, and then you go to the next stage. You get rid of obvious ideas that won't work. And then you just take a break. Then you walk walk away from it. Just clear your mind. Do anything else except work on this problem. And then you come to the next stage. And this is the illumination stage. This is where an ideal pops in your head out of nowhere. This takes place on the right side of your brain. And that is the creative side of your brain. So think about those times where you have a problem and you've probably given up on the problem and you walk away from it a day later or while you're in the shower, all of a sudden the solution just pops up. This is the illumination um, stage. This is like when, aha, I get it. This what this is what I need to do, or this is how to solve the problem. Okay. So here's some example um, of illumination. So, of course, if we were in class together, um, we would do this little experiment. Um, I'm going to show you five letters, and I want you to try to figure out which one of the five letters are least like the other letters. Okay. So you have A, Z, F, N, and E. All capital letters. And I'll let you look at it for a second. So I've had different responses over class periods. Um, and I can't think of the most common one. I think it more people say that the Z is different. And I can't remember why, but in fact, that's not the answer. And I'm curious to know which one you thought was the answer. The answer is E. Now, before I tell you why, take a look at E and see why you think it may be different. E is made with four lines. All the other letters are made with three, and that's what makes it different. That point where you figured out where that E was different or why E was different, that's the illumination stage. That's when it's you have that aha moment. Let's look at another one. This one is usually pretty easy. Um, which one of the five is least like the other four. So you have touch, taste, hear, smell, and see. The answer is smell. And the reason why is because smell is a facial expression and the others are senses. Okay. And that's another illumination um, period where it just pop up in your head and then you have the answer to the question or the problem. And let's look at the fifth stage, the last stage, reality. Basically, you're, you ask yourself three questions. Does this solve the problem? Does it fit the condition? And is it going to be accepted? So think in terms of you coming up with an ad. You have a problem that you're trying to solve. You're focusing on something um, based on your strategy. Does it fit the condition? Um, basically, is it does it fit the budget? Can this really be produced? Or is this some great ideal I conjured up in my head and it can't even be produced? And then is it going to be accepted? Um, is it accepted by the client, the account team? 
um, the other creatives, um, society, it's not offensive, or things like, under that nature. <clears throat> the difference between a good creative and an average creator, and your goal is to be a great creative. A great creative goes from step five, which is reality, and back to step one, to preparation, and start all over again. So keep these things in mind once again, once you're coming up with your own designs. And we're going to end this video here. Um, we're going to pick up with a few more slides that we're going to watch in class together. Um, we're going to watch a um, video of a whole process um, at, at an agency of how this whole creative process works. But this is it for now for the creative process um, and creativity.